hello, hello. Uh, <laughs> welcome to ICON. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, am I, am I in the wrong place? <laughs> um, hey, I didn't expect so many of you to stick around, so thank you, thank you very much. Hello, RailsConf. Hello, everybody. So, so I am going to introduce myself because I think that there are many people here who don't know who I am. And uh, the way that I found that out is because I kept trying to airdrop people my cat and they declined it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was me. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Tenderlove, that is my, my given name. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I look a bit different than I do online. This is my, <laughs> this is my online persona, and I guess, uh, as Justin says, this has to be my brand. I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life, so I'm sorry. Um, I work for a company called uh, GitHub. Uh, it's a website where you can go and share code. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a legit company to work for. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I went to the office, and the office is actually called uh, Legit Hub uh, for French people. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm on the Rails core team and also the Ruby core team. I have some cats. This is one of them. This is uh, SeaTac Airport Facebook YouTube uh, Instagram Snapchat. Is her full name? We call her Choo Choo for short. Uh, <laughs> This is Gorbachev, Puff Puff, Thunder Horse the third. Um, he's not a very good conversationalist. Frequently, he, he ends up uh, just making mistakes and putting his foot in his own mouth. Uh, so I have, I have stickers of my cat, and hopefully you got them from me, because this is the very last talk, and I don't know if I'll be around. Uh, but I have stickers of them, so if you'd like a sticker, come see me. Uh, but all right, let's, let's move on a little bit here. Um, speaking, so. <laughs> Speaking of things that are orange and like to puke on my floor, I want to take a minute to talk about Hacker News. Uh, <laughs> so I drew, I drew this slide. <laughs> so I, li I like to be on the internet. I'm on the internet, on the Twitters. And a lot of the people that I follow, they think that, they think that Hacker News sucks. They're always saying, oh, Hacker News sucks, Hacker News sucks. And I'm like, why do they say this so much? Are they actually reading it? Is that, is that <laughs> if you hate it so bad, why are you reading it? <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing is, like, I actually like to, I like to browse Hacker News and read the comments and stuff. I read them so that you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> The, but the reason I read them is because I like to think about I like to think about how they got it wrong and how they can fix it. So recently, like recently, there was a there was an article that was like, why why Slack is inappropriate for open source communications? And I'm like, why is it? Is it? I don't I don't know. Uh, so I was reading the comments, and one of the comments was, you know, we are temporarily in a kind of dark ages for end user open source software, and I was like, we are. It's actually true. In fact, the other day, my friend, he, he, got bit, he got bit by a rat, and he actually died of the plague. It's literally the dark ages. It's really the dark ages. I, I drew that, too. <laughs> Uh, so another another article that I read was Electron is Electron is Flash for the desktop, and I'm like, really? It's Flash for the desktop, and and Slack it often idles at five percent of our CPU. It, it uses up five percent of the CPU all the time, and I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. So let's say you have your let's say you have your CPU, and Slack is chewing up five percent of that CPU. Well, one way to solve this problem is to actually just purchase a larger CPU. You, <laughs> you can see clearly now that it uses much less than 5% of the CPU. <laughs> so the lesson here is buy a bigger CPU, you dummy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if Alan Turning were reading these comments, he would be so mad, he would be turning in his grave. He, he is a real person. Just. <laughs> 
so I know I read another another article about language features that I thought was I thought was interesting and said no no generics and no some types. I think this is about Go or something. There are there are no these are ground no longer groundbreaking features. There's a minimum. So it means that if your language doesn't have generics, it means your language is a failure. It means your language is a failure. And actually, this comment is true. It's totally true. And the reason this comment is true is because insurance companies only cover generics. So, <laughs> so if you take your programming language to, to the hospital, they're just going to say, no, I'm sorry, your language has been denied. They will not, they will not take that. I drew that, too. <laughs> so anyway, this, this is all I have to say. All I have to say about Hacker News, just don't read it. I mean, unless you want to know all the future episodes of Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'm, from, I'm from Seattle. Uh, we have a space needle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm a really huge fan of supporting local businesses. I love to support local businesses. Uh, and in Seattle, my favorite thing to do is I, I like to drink a lot of local coffee. Um, <laughs> So I was trying to find out about different local things to do here in Arizona. So I, I went and I decided to try out some of your local brew, uh, which is uh, Arizona tea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually had to go to three different convenience stores. Or I went to three different convenience stores, and none of them had Arizona tea there. Uh, so I started to think, like, well, maybe in Arizona they just call it tea, and I can't, you can't actually, you can't actually buy it here. And then I found out it was for sale at the CVS, so I went to the CVS and purchased some. Uh, and then I looked on the back of it, and it turns out it's actually made in New York. Uh, and I asked the, I asked the teller about it. I'm like, oh, this is made in New York. I thought this was Arizona, like an Arizona thing. And and she said, no, no, only like. Only tourists drink that. And <laughs> like, okay, well, I'm a tourist, so thank you. <laughs> so, all right, I want to get to I want to get to the next section of my presentation, which is one of my favorite favorite parts of the presentation. Every year when I give a keynote, I like to I like to have this section in my talk, which is the trolling DHH section. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's an annual annual tradition. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this year was really hard. It was very, it's very hard to come up with ideas because uh, the, I think like the main points of DHH's talk was that you know he's he's gotten older, and as he's gotten older, he's learned that other people also have valid opinions. <laughs> And I mean, there's not much bad you can say about that. So, so I didn't know, like, I didn't know what to do about this. But okay, I, you know, I, I'm gonna sow a little bit of doubt here. So I've got a question. I got a question for all of you. Uh, if Rails is so good, then how come there isn't a city named after it? The other, the other th thing that he mentioned in his talk was that there's no way, there's no way to scientifically prove which language is best. And actually, this is completely wrong. This is a totally wrong statement. Just ask any Haskell developer, and they will tell you <laughs> there is a mathematical way to prove that Haskell is the correct language to use. Anyway, uh, I'm so I'm a faith-based programmer. So I'm down, I <laughs> every day, every day I say the programmer's prayer. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 also, I also religiously listened to George Michael. <laughs> the other thing that was wrong with his presentation is he clearly did not put the, he did not put the clear winner of the console wars, which was the Neo Geo. This, this, one, this is the winner. It had 24-bit audio. <laughs> the, like, you know, the 16 or 12-bit crap. Come on. <laughs> Anyway, so I realized I realized this year that I've been doing I've been doing Rails for over ten years. Uh, I got my first Rails job in 2006. That's when I started started doing Rails professionally. Uh, and I wanted to tell you I want to tell you a story about my first not not Rails program, my first Ruby program, uh, my first like real Ruby program. Uh, my first real Ruby program I wrote in 2003. So it was, it was 2003, 2003, and in this year. This year, Lord of the Rings was coming out. Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. 
And I was really excited about this. I was excited. You'll notice the release date on that is December 17th, OK? Now, my birthday is December 16th. And they were coming out with this movie. This movie, they're going to play this one and the other two back to back in a movie theater. So it's like 10 hours of movies, right? And I, they were going to do this a day early on my birthday. So I really wanted to see, like, I really wanted to see it. Now, at the time, I was a J2EE developer. And oh, this is a secret. So I thought, I thought there were only going to be my five best friends in the audience. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to say that part. I used to do J2EE development. And it would take about, like, you know, 10 minutes to compile our code. And like, I have an extremely short attention span. So 10 minutes, I'm like, I, I forgot what I was doing. But anyway, I'm like, what, what, you know, what should I do with this 10 minutes of, 10 minutes of free time? Thought to myself, well, you know, I want to buy these, I want to buy these tickets. And I go to the website, I try to buy, try to buy the movie tickets and the website breaks. It just doesn't work. It's like crashing under load. I mean, it's 2003. People did not know how to sell tickets online at the time. Uh, <laughs> So I'm like, OK, well, I've got 10 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try writing a Ruby program that will go buy the tickets for me. OK, so I, I wrote this Ruby program during my compile time that would go to the website, enter, enter all the information, including my credit card number. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and try to purchase these tickets. And the thing is, I knew, so I knew what would happen when it failed, when the website failed, right? So I would go to the website, I'd fill it out, and I knew what the page looked like when it failed. Uh, but I didn't know what a success case looked like, because I couldn't buy the tickets. So what I did was, essentially, is like, I'm like, OK, if I don't get a failure, if I don't get a failure, I'm just going to log a message. Okay? And I thought, well, I'll see it in the terminal. I'll see that in the terminal, and then I'll know, like, oh, I need to go check out, see what's up. So I go back to writing some JSP or whatever it was, like probably configuring some XML files. Uh, and later on, I noticed, like I noticed, oh my god, the, the, the output on my terminal is different. What is going on? And I see, I see all of a sudden, like, it had actually been succeeding. <laughs> and I scroll up through the terminal, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> So I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? How many, how many movie tickets did I buy? So I, <laughs> I, called, uh, I called the credit card company, and I asked them like the most, I don't know, like <laughs> non-legit question ever. I'm like, hi, uh, I was wondering, how many times have I charged my credit card today? <laughs> like, who asked that? that? I mean, if there's a suspicious question, that, that is one of them. And so the, you know, the person was very helpful. They said, oh, you, well, you've only charged your credit card once. And I'm like, OK, great, just once, OK. So I wanted to make sure that I actually got the movie tickets. So I called the, I called the movie theater. Uh, and I don't know, like, looking back on this, I don't know how they actually had this data, but they did. So I, I asked them, like, hey, uh, I tried to buy some movie tickets from you, and I'm just wondering if the, you know, your site was down. I was just wondering if the transaction actually went through and if I actually got the movie tickets. And a person looks up the data for me, and they say, yeah, yeah, you, you were able to buy some tickets, but it looks like we've tried to charge your credit card hundreds of times. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, really? I don't, I don't. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I was just hitting refresh. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> so that was my that was my very first serious Ruby program was back 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 then. OK, so I want to talk, let's talk a little bit about technical debt. And I should move a little faster. I have a lot of slides here. So let's talk a little bit about technical debt. Justin talked a little bit about it in his, in his talk. But I want to talk about a new strategy for t dealing with technical debt uh, that I've come up with. So we know that developers want to pay off technical debt. So as a developer, you want to pay off technical debt. Uh, but, you know, many of us in the Ruby community have grown up and become managers. I've been in the Ruby community for a, an extremely long time, and managers don't actually want to pay off technical debt, right? Because it takes, it takes time away. They'd rather be adding features or whatever it is that they want, you know, they want to ship. So what's happening is we've got this community that's growing up, and we're ending up with all these people who used to be developers, and now they're managers, and they had published all of these gems, and all of these gems have some sort of technical debt in them. 
So what I want to do, my idea is, I want to create a meta gem, and this meta gem will actually package up all of these gems that have technical debt in them. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to call this meta gem a bond. And <laughs> now these bonds are made of gems that have classes, and these classes have extremely low FICO scores. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to take those classes and we're going to shop them around to different companies like, uh, <laughs> Like test double, and if test double won't give us good FICO scores, then we'll go we'll go to a different go to a different consultancy, is the one down the road, and see if we can get a better get a better score. So we're gonna we're gonna package all those gems, try to get them better scores, gems, or as we call them tranches. Uh, <laughs> so the other my my other strategy for this is that you know what we can do is we can take we can take uh, dependencies from other other communities, for example, younger communities like the JavaScript community, they have newer developers and they want to pay off their technical debt more quickly. So these, their packages are probably like AAA rated. So what we want to do is start pointing at things like Webpack, for example, which has a good, you know, good credit rating so that we can actually sell these, sell these uh, gems a little bit easier. Now what I think this is doing, I, you know, I, I don't want to be too forward about this, but basically what this is doing is when we, de when we depend on these younger communities, that's actually helping us feed off the blood of young people. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Rather than doing our, rather than being able to focus on our, <laughs> We want to depend on these younger communities so that we can focus on our core competencies, which is concatenating a bunch of strings. <laughs> All right, so, so, <laughs> so earlier today, Sarah was talking about how uh, the different talks at RailsConf are going to be, you know, we have like uh, forests and forests and trees and we, you know, getting into the weeds, the individual discussions are getting into the weeds. And I'm sure you're thinking, okay, well, you know, Aaron's from the Northwest, so we're probably going to have, you know, this beautiful, like, beautiful looking forest. We're going to have a forest talk here, since this is a keynote. But as I go on with this, I'm afraid you're going to see that we, we might start getting into the weeds here. We're going to get into the weeds with this talk. But um, what I really, really want you to know is that this is actually a forest talk, okay? This is a forest talk. It's just that it's a dead forest talk, okay? It's, it's a dead forest talk, and you'll realize this at the end of the talk. Hopefully, what I want you to take away from this talk at the end of it is, uh, where did my 40 minutes go? <laughs> Give me back my time, Aaron. <laughs> so before, before we go too further, though, this is not a joke. I, I need to do a part that's not a joke. OK, so five. <laughs> five. Five dollar. $5 foot long. No, OK, uh, all right, sorry. 5.1, Rails 5.1. I am very pleased to announce that Rails 5.1 is out. So. I am honored. I think this is the first time I've been able to announce a Rails release. And I want to say thank you. Thank you to the rest of the team. Thank you to the contributors, especially thank you to Raphael. Uh, he did so much work to make this happen, so please. All right, so I, I originally wanted to title this talk, um, I, I don't have time for this. <laughs> I want to talk about things that I would like to do, but I don't have time to do them. And I like this title because it's, it's non-committal. Like I don't, you know, who, you know, it's just some things. I don't know, I don't have time. To, there's some things I'd like to do, and I don't have time. It's also a humorous use of a common phrase, which I think is good. Uh, the problem, though, the problem, though, is that when you're a keynote speaker, the, the organizers tell you, you know, oh, there, you can talk about whatever you want to. There's no pressure. There's no pressure. And of course, whenever anybody says that to me, I, it just means it's all of the pressure for me. It's just extreme pressure, an extreme amount of pressure. And in fact, I actually took the Cyril's Briggs test, and somehow my result was stress. I don't like. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
so I, you know, I, I'm thinking I want this, you know, I like this talk title, but then I'm, over, I'm overcome by fear and self-doubt. I just think to myself, you know, what if I totally screw up? I'm going to sound like, like, I'm going to sound like I was arrogant, like I didn't prepare for the talk, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't do enough work. So I thought, okay, well, what if I say, what if I call it like five things I don't have time to do? So I'll change it to that so it's more concrete, people know what to expect. But then, then I, I. <laughs> I got even more worried. I'm like, what if, I, what if I don't actually have time to present five things? Or what if I want to talk about things that I do have time for? Now I'm limiting myself. What, what can I title it now? So the real, the real title of this presentation is some things that I don't have time to do, but you should do them. So maybe like three things, but I have time to do the other things. <laughs> so that's the actual title of the talk. Uh, I've split it into two, two uh, <laughs> segments. The, the probably important segment and the definitely not important segment. So we're going to go through the probably important segment. And then after that, I want you to all shut your brains off and just relax because trust me, this presentation is a huge waste of your time. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about HTTP2 and RAC. And I'm going to refer to it as H2 from now on. This is a thing that I do have time for. Let's talk about what is, what is H2. Uh, H2, well, it's a version of HTTP that's one better than H1. Uh, most of us, I realize most of you are using HTTP 1.1, so it's actually 0.9 better than that, but it's still better, still an improvement. So really, really what it is is uh, this list of stuff. It's a binary protocol. It multiplexes, which means that you can do a request and a response over the same uh, TCP connection. Uh, it's secure. It only works over SSL. That is not technically true. It'll work over a plain text connection, but all the all of or an unencrypted connection. But all the major browser vendors only support it over over SSL. Uh, and the other major thing is push responses. And I'm not going to talk about the first three because they don't really impact us as web developers. I'm just going to talk about the last one because that's the major change for us as application developers. So push response flow, in a, normal, in a normal H1 application, your request and response will look something like this. You have an HTML page. Uh, that HTML page gets returned. It depends on jQuery and, say, my cat's CSS file, right? So we have to go back and forth and get all of these. Now, with H2, uh, when a user requests that index.html page, we know that they're going to need jQuery or, and the CSS file. So what we can do is we can say, OK, uh, when you make a request to index HTML, I'm also going to push down these other assets as well. They're going to come down along with it without you needing to request it. So we're saving time by pushing these needed resources down to, down to the client. Now, unfortunately, this has a problem. There's, there's some problems with H2. And the problem is that H2 is stateless in the same way that HTTP1 is. So we don't necessarily know whether or not somebody has received that asset. So we, we have a problem where maybe we send those assets down to the user, and they already have, they already have jQuery. So in that particular case, the client may, may actually cancel it. So we'll, have to, we'll send them index. It tries to send them jQuery, tries to send them the CSS file. And the client actually has to say, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. And in some cases, it may not say, oh, I don't want that. It may just take the asset. And now you've actually sent the asset to the client once. So the client can cancel. Or we may actually resend the assets. Both of these are problems with this type of push uh, push service. So the solution is uh, H2O and salt. <laughs> ah, I feed on your pain. <laughs> it energizes me. <laughs> no, okay, really, the, the solution is H2O and cookies. Uh, so let's talk about H2O. H2O is, and yes, this is an annoying URL that is example with L as the number one, okay? Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, H2O, H2O is a proxy. It's an HTTP2 uh, web server. It's a proxy server. And I'm going to talk about the solution that it uses for dealing with this asset problem. And it sits in front of your application just like, say, Nginx would, for example. Uh, so we have a client here, and the client talks to our proxy, our H2O proxy, and then the proxy talks to our application server. Now the proxy speaks H1 to our app server, and it speaks H2 to the client. 
So if we want to do H2 pushes, we actually can with an H1 web server. And the way that we do that is we can use the link, what's called a link header. So we, when we send the response, uh, for example, this response, the proxy will actually get the response, look at these link tags, and say, okay, I'm gonna push those assets down to the client. So in this particular flow, our server responds with some value like that, it sends it over to the proxy. The proxy says, uh, okay, I, I am going to push these assets down to the client. Now, H2O, what it does, what the web server does, is it actually makes a fingerprint of those, those assets and stores them in a cookie. Now, if you've already pushed those assets down to the client, uh, it won't push them again. So it knows, it knows whether or not it needs to actually push those, push those assets down to the client. And this is extremely nice for us because it means that in our application, we don't have to do any state tracking. We can just say, I'm just gonna push these down. I know it's an index, I'm gonna send you the link, link headers, uh, you deal with it. So the proxy takes care of all of that for us. Now there's one problem with this response and that's that uh, if you look at the response here, uh, we actually have to send the link header after we calculate the response code. So what if we don't actually know that it's a 200 yet? What if we wanna send some assets regardless of what the response code is? So the way that we can do that is with a new, there is a new proposal being uh, proposed, eh, verbs, whatever, uh, called the 103 early, early hints response. And what this is is just a new response code that basically has no body and it looks like this. We just stuff our link headers into that. So that previous example would change to this. So we can send a 103, a 103 with the link link header and then go on and do the rest of our page processing. And uh, H2O understands, understands this 103 response. So this allows us to send push responses without calculating the status code. So let's talk about rack support. Uh, and this is going to come into rack 3.0. Uh, the main thing that we're missing from rack is we're missing this push, uh, push response. So essentially what we're going to do is add another hash key, Woo. yeah. Yes, now I'm not very excited about this solution uh, because I, I don't really like the API of just passing hashes and stuff everywhere. But the win that we get from this is that uh, it's backwards compatible, you'll be able to upgrade your applications without breaking anything, uh, and you can actually gracefully upgrade your application. So we can say, all right, I wanna take, I'm ready to take advantage of uh, pushes, so I can, do, like, I can do that now with my web server. Uh, and this is all coming in Rack 3.0. Hold on a sec, getting a little dry here. <sighs> oh, local T. <laughs> Support local, actually, you know what, I'm gonna set this down here, I don't wanna. <sighs> I like the joke, but I don't like it enough to ruin my laptop. <laughs> so, all right, let's, this was the part that you had to pay attention to. Now, feel free to shut off your brains for the rest of the presentation. Uh, we're gonna talk about code smells. So I wanna, I wanna talk about code smells. So uh, I've been working on a project at home. I've been collecting a lot of data. And this is, this is some data that I've been acquiring. I have a digital signal that I've been collecting at home. And I apologize, the signal is, it's not very good. The data is, the data is kinda crap. Uh, and I wanna, do some, I wanna do some analysis on this data. Okay, so I wanna do some processing on it, and I've been trying to do the processing in Ruby. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's a lot of data. I've been, recording, I've been recording a data point every second since, what is that, uh, January 23rd this year, so it's still recording as we speak. Uh, and I've been trying to do data processing on it, but I need to do a lot of math, and I'd like a way to increase or speed up mathematic operations in Ruby. So I was thinking lately about doing some Ruby VM tricks, and I'm gonna show them to you, show you what I've been thinking about doing today. So first we need to talk about how a VM works. Uh, the way a VM works is, it's pretty easy. We have, a, we have a program, and there's a stack, and then there's a program counter, and this program counter always pushes at the next instruction to execute. So the way these instructions work is they just manipulate this stack. So first we'll push on a number four to the stack, then we'll push a number three onto the stack, then we'll add, and the way add works is it pops the two values off the stack and pushes the new value onto the stack so we get seven. Now the way that this is actually implemented is uh, something like this. We have a list of instructions, 
and we have a loop. We loop over the instructions, we get the next one, and we look up what that, the method for that next one, and then we execute that method, and we just keep running through this loop over and over again. Now, there's a way that we can actually speed this up, and we can, we can actually eliminate this loop that loops over the instructions, and we can do that by generating the virtual machine. So if we, if we generate the virtual machine, we can generate a bunch of functions, and each function, each function represents the instruction sequence that we're going to execute. So this is what the VM might look like. We have a couple instructions, or a few instructions implemented there, and we have this small bit of code at the end of each function that's been generated. That bit of code right there is generated. And what that does at the end of each function is it looks up the next instruction to execute and then just calls that one. So we're able to eliminate that infinite loop. Uh, this technique is what's called a threaded virtual machine. So you can think of it as threading. We're going through one function and popping out of that function into the next one, and we keep going and going. So we're threading through the instructions rather than doing a loop. Now, there's a problem with these function calls. The problem with function calls is that we can end up with a very deep stack. So what we'd like to do is eliminate these function calls. So we can actually do that by uh, getting, rid of the, getting rid of the function lookup. So what we say here is we say, okay, this, this is our normal, our normal lookup process. We actually look up the function and we call send and that goes and calls the function. Instead what we can do, and this is a trick that you can't do in Ruby, it's a trick you have to do in C, is we end up with a switch statement like this, a label, a label with a bunch of go-tos. I use the word jump because that is, um, I don't know, I guess it's more socially acceptable than go-to. Um, so what we do is we actually look up the address of the place that we need to jump to. So we have, this, we have this generated bit right here. So we say, all right, we're gonna generate this, we'll look up the address we need to jump to, and then we jump to that. So we don't actually have to, we don't actually have to call a function anymore. We still have a problem here. There's a way we can speed up this VM even further, and that's eliminating that table lookup. We can get rid of that table. So instead of, instead of looking up the address that we need to jump to, instead we embed that address into the bytecode itself. So when we're compiling your code, we embed that address into the instruction sequences. So then when we look it up, we just say, okay, jump to this address directly. We don't have that jump table anymore. And this is what is called a direct threaded VM. And this is, the, this is the VM that's used in Ruby MRI today, where the interesting thing is that these addresses are just integers, they're just arbitrary integers inside of your computer's memory, and we just jump to them. So MRI's VM is direct threaded. So what I would like to do is create custom instructions built from machine, and build machine code at runtime. Since those instructions are just integers, they're just places to jump to, we could actually just insert our own, our own address and jump to that thing and have it execute there. Uh, so I put together a very simple example of this. Uh, please read it carefully. This actually uses LLVM to assemble machine code and we can execute that machine code from Ruby. The only thing that's missing here is actually disassembling the, the uh, VM code and inserting our own integer to jump to. So my first idea of stuff that I don't have time for is creating custom instructions at runtime that we can actually speed up our mathematical operations. So, okay, we've got one way we can speed this up. Uh, now, back to, back to the data. I've got, you know, a faster VM would definitely help analyze this data, but a uh, fast VM isn't gonna do us any good unless we have algorithms that can help us deal with, uh, help us deal with analyzing this data. So in order to analyze this digital signal, uh, I would actually like to build a police scanner. So now, you know, I am, I am 36 year old, six years old. I am soon to be a, I am now a homeowner. I need to be sitting on my front porch listening to a police scanner because that is what old people do. <laughs> Uh, yes, you'll be me in the future, I'm sorry. So I, I bought one of these, this is a very neat tool. It is a software-defined radio that you can, a radio you can plug into USB. Uh, now I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you an example of what the software actually looks like when you use this on your computer. Uh, it looks like this, this is live. I'm actually scanning, doing some police scanning right now. That bar in the center there is a digital signal. Uh, the digital signal indicates what channel people are broadcasting on. So the digital signal is used to coordinate between different channels. This is what's called a trunking scanner. So you can see up there I'm actually manually moving the, moving the signal left and right. So the audio voices are actually analog and the, the thing that coordinates which frequency those analog signals are on is that digital signal that's there in the middle. And I'm gonna mute this. 
So you get an idea, you get an idea what we're dealing with here. So you can move it back and forth. Uh, this is an example of an FM band, FM band radio, so you can see it's a little bit wider. This narrow FM that police use, uh, this is what it looks like. In the middle there is our digital signal, our digital trunking signal. And over on these little, these little bars that you can see jumping around, those are our audio signals that we need to listen to. So we have to be able to decode that digital signal in order to find the audio signals to listen to. So to do this, we do uh, digital signal processing, and this is actually split into two different, two different signals. There's two types of signals, uh, continuous signals and discrete signals. Uh, continuous signals are like maybe the light is coming to you, right? You see light or you hear music. A discrete signal is what we deal with on the computer because we actually have to take samples of those things. We can't store an infinite, an infinite number of points on the computer, so we deal with discrete, discrete, uh, discrete signals. Uh, and I made this. Persona 5 people, please appreciate this. Thank you. I worked very hard on that. Uh, so discrete signals are just a list of points. So again, we've got, we've got this discrete signal here, and I, I do apologize for this crappy data. It is really just crap data. I apologize. Uh, but this is a discrete signal that I'm, I'm trying to deal with. So the way that we deal with these is through a process called convolution. And this is what, what convolution is, is taking two signals combining them into a third signal. And this is, this is kind of what we're doing here. I, I apologize for the star, that star there. The star is actually the mathematical notation for convolution. Unfortunately, it's also the thing we use for multiplication in computers. So convolution is taking these two signals and coming up with a third signal from that. The formal definition is like this. Uh, we're not going to, I won't describe it here. We'll do it in pictures. Uh, so we have three signals here. That top one is our original signal. The middle one is the signal that we want to convolute with, and the third one is our resulting signal. So the code for actually doing this is, this is the code for doing it in Ruby. And I want you to notice that it's uh, based on arrays. Uh, we're using array indexes in this, and our array indexes start at zero. This is important. Uh, so convolu our convoluted signal length is actually the, signal, the length of the two signals minus one. And the way the algorithm works is we have a signal at the top there, that's our origin signal. The signal at the bottom is the one we want to convolute with. And we take the, those points on the bottom signal and multiply them times the points on the top signal and then sum those to get that, the point in the resulting, the resulting signal. So we actually move it along. It starts at zero like this and we move it along like that and keep calculating those and that's how we come up with the, come up with the new signal. So we're going to look at a few low pass filters. Low pass filters are just these little chunks that we apply to our, apply to the signal. So this is an identity signal. Uh, it's just the number one. And if we take the original signal, convolute it with the identity signal, then we just end up with the same signal again. Uh, we can actually use this to uh, define an amplifier. So instead of multiplying by two, one, we have a two. So it looks the same, but you can see that bottom signal is actually twice as high. We can use this to shift a signal, one to the right. So if we set point one to one, uh, we've actually shifted our resulting signal to the right by one. And we can take these, take these uh, little kernels and combine them together to do interesting things to the signal. For example, we can make an echo. So we have a, we have a uh, amplifier plus a shifter, which comes up with an echo. We can even come up with an average. So we'll, we'll take these two signals and figure out the average of a signal. And the reason I want to do this is because taking the average of the signal will smooth out that, smooth out that random data at the bottom, but keep, the, keep those sharp edges, which is what we're trying to detect. We can actually use this for radars as well. So for example, if we transmit a signal like the one on the left, and we get a signal like the one on the right that contains random noise in it, we can answer the question, does one signal contain the other? And we do that by taking the received signal and convoluting that with the transmitted signal. And if that re the received signal contains the transmitted signal, then you'll get a very high spike where it is. So we can actually detect when, detect when our signal is there. Another neat thing that you can do is you can come up with a Gaussian distribution. So if you take one signal and you convolute it with itself a few times, you'll actually end up with a Gaussian distribution like this. And I just think that that is neat. Uh, so again, here's our, here's our convolution code. And remember, it, uh, it's based off of zero-based indexes. And I thought to myself, you know, I've got I've to do, do all these transformations, and I want to graph them, and I want to graph them in R. 
uh, because doing it in R is pretty, you know, pretty cool. Like, I, it makes you look smart and stuff. Even though the graphs are crappy, everybody's like, oh, crappy graphs, you use R. Uh, <laughs> so, so I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm going to port this, I'm going to port this Ruby code to R and then graph, graph that data. So I learned, I learned about R the hard way. Uh, I took this, I just ported the code straight over to R, and it turns out that in R, arrays are actually one-based. They're based on one. Now, what's really extremely fun about this language is if you ask it for the zeroth element, it gives you the type that's stored in that array. So in this case, numeric. I have a list of integers. And what's even more fun is that you can perform mathematical operations on that type, and it just works. No error. So. <laughs> I'm like, why are these calculations totally wrong? I, I, I was very frustrated. So I thought to myself, you know, I, I don't want to figure out, I don't want to figure out how to port my Ruby code to use one-based indexes. I'm not that smart. There must be an easier way. I thought to myself, there must be an easier way. All right, so back to the data, back to this data. All right, so I've got this data, and I'm, I'm sorry, it is crap data. We're, we're trying to improve it. Uh, but it is, it is crap. Uh, so I didn't want to figure out how to deal with these one-based indexes. So my next, my next thing that I want to do, and I just don't have time to do it, is implementing cons, car, and cutter in different languages, but using only lambdas. And you may be asking yourself, why? <laughs> why would you do that to yourself? And the reason is I like learning new languages, but I don't have much time. I don't have much time to learn a whole bunch of new languages. So I thought to myself, what is the bare minimum that I can learn in any particular language in order to get endorsed on LinkedIn? And, <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, the one thing that I can learn, if I learn this and if I learn lambdas in every single language, then that should be enough to get me into any, you know, get me endorsed on LinkedIn. So lambda is the thing I want to learn in any target language. So what are cons, car, and cutter? Uh, cons actually forms a cell of a left and right, a left and right thing. So we just have two things here. Now, uh, the function car returns the left side of the cell, so it'll give us back the left side. Uh, the function cutter will actually return the right side of the cell. Now, can we do this only using lambdas? And the answer is yes, we can, and I've written it in three languages here for you. This is R, uh, Node, and Ruby. And I call it Node because I don't know the difference between Node and JavaScript. And I actually, I actually posted this function onto Twitter, and I was like, oh, why do I have to type return so much? And then I got all, like tons of responses that are like, why don't you use ES6, bro? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> So this is, a, this is kind of a mouthful, and I need to move. Uh, but what it is is uh, cons is a function that returns a function, and that function that it returns takes a function and calls that function. <laughs> so it returns a function. All right, OK, so don't think about this too hard, please. So car, what it does, it's a function that uh, takes a function and calls a function and passes a function and the function that it passes returns the left side. And actually, the easiest way to see this is using, using R. So I've defined cons and R, and if we call cons, you'll see that it actually returns two things, a function, so like I said, it returns a function, and it returns an environment. And the environment is the thing that actually captures, that, captures those two values. And you'll see car is just a function, uh, and I can, pass that, I can pass the return value of cons to car and recover my original, original value. Now here is uh, the cutter implementation, and it actually just returns the right side. It looks exactly the same as the as uh, uh, car. We're just returning the right side rather than the left side. So with this, we can actually form a tree of a tree of cells. So we can say like, okay, we have a one and a two, or we have a one on the left side, and the right side points at another cell, and then we can just keep doing this and end up with null on the very end, and we can actually turn this into an array. So if I implement a function called each, we can iterate over that, over that list. Uh, now here's an example of usage. This is, this is in JavaScript. We can see we cons together a bunch of stuff, and we can actually loop over those and get, get our values back. So what's neat about this is it means, well, we don't need loops anymore. I don't need to know how your language implements loops. Uh, I don't need to know how your language implements arrays. Uh, if I implement my own hash, hashing function, I don't need to know how your language implements hashes because I can just use a tree. 
So what about numbers? Well, we can actually eliminate that too. I don't want to know how numbers work in your language either. Uh, and we can do that using a, using a thing called church numeral encoding. And what that is is we define a function that calls something zero times, that's zero. Uh, we define a function that calls a function that you pass in once, that's one. Uh, and if we call the function twice, that's two, or three times, that's three, and that's the way that we encode these. And if you look at the very bottom there, I can prove to you that three is equivalent to three by passing in a function that just increments by one. So we get three back from that. Now, I'm lazy, I don't want to define every single one of these, so I can actually define a function that's called add, since we know that we just need to call that function the number of times for the number that it is. So we can define uh, the function one, we define add, then we can define two and three and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have all the numbers, and this is called church encoding. So I no longer need your numbers. Uh, I know how to do add, I can figure out how to do subtract and multiply and divide, so I don't need your mathematics. Uh, I can even circumvent logic as well, so if I implement, I can implement true and false in, in lambdas, and I can implement conditionals with those. I'm not gonna go into that, because I do need to move along. So we don't need Booleans, uh, we don't need conditionals. I don't really need any of your language, I just need lambdas. So back to my, back to my crap data. Back to our original problem, I didn't want to rewrite my algorithm using one-based arrays, right? I wanted to rewrite that, I wanted to write it using zero-based arrays. And now that I can implement an array in any target language that I want to, I can make my array zero-based. So what I did in R is I implement cons, car, cutter. <laughs> then I implement each, then I implement each with index. And now I have, now I have an array, and I implemented uh, array indexing, so I can say like, at, I want to, I want to get uh, an element at a particular index, and I'm gonna make that index zero. Uh, and I can actually take those vectors from, vectors from R and turn them into con cells, and now I can actually port that convolution code straight over to R using zero-based indexes. <laughs> yes! <laughs> All right, okay, okay, okay. So. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself. I feed in some test data. I got some test data there. I'm able to plot it. Uh, I can perform filters on it. I can, do, I can uh, define a filter, plot the data, the filter, and then do a convolution on the data and plot that as well. So I can see, this is our, these are our crappy graphs. You can see I know how to use R. Uh, so I, I'm pretty proud of myself at this point. I'm like, yes, nice, it looks good. So I'm like, okay, let's take our real data and input it and I take my real data that I'm trying to, trying to analyze, I input it, and unfortunately it says, error. Evaluation nested too deeply, infinite recursion. It turns out that R does not support uh, tail call recursion, so this blows out the stack, and I just think, I hate R. <laughs> so things I don't have time for, figuring out R. <laughs> All right, back to, back to the crap data. So, <laughs> I've accomplished nothing. <laughs> but I want to I share with you. I want to share with you something that I built that actually acquires this data. So I want to show you where I got this data from and what I'm trying to what I'm actually trying to figure out with this data. So I want to show you something that I built. Uh, and what I built was I have I have this contraption right here. Uh, what it's composed of a bathroom scale. So we have a bathroom scale. Uh, we have an MSP430. This is a microcontroller that is able to read off of the scale and give us the, give us the weight data over a serial connection. Uh, and then I have a Raspberry Pi plus, plus a motion sensor, and the Raspberry Pi will read that weight data over the serial connection. So I have it set up at home like this. So at the top there is, uh, at the top is where I have the Raspberry Pi mounted with the uh, motion detector. And at the bottom there, that orange bar is the, uh, the scale. Now, on top of the scale, uh, I actually have what is known as a litter box. And <laughs> when the cat goes in to the litter box, I can detect that and the cat leaves and I know, I know that the cat has left. <laughs> so that is where this graph comes from. Uh, <laughs> I'm not done, okay, I'm not done, <laughs> I'm not done. 
so, so, so on the left hand side, this is where the cat enters, and on the right hand side, that is where the cat leaves. And if we calculate the difference between those two, we can figure out approximately how much was left behind. <laughs> Which I have calculated to be about 100 grams. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up. I want to wrap this up with a little kernel of knowledge for you to take home <laughs> so that you don't feel like my entire talk was a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> so what I really want to let you know what you should take home from this conference today is that it's very hard to make shit scale. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am, it was an honor to be here. Thank you.